Last week, I finished reading Berserk. I have read everything, from the beginning of the Black Swordsman arc all the way up to chapter 364. I am no longer shackled by ignorance, like I was back in January when I put out my first video on Berserk. At that time, I had only read up to the beginning of the Conviction arc. Now, I no longer have to worry about recklessly speculating, only to be contradicted by future events in the manga. I can finally analyze and explain Berserk from an authoritative standpoint. But before I do, I ask that you indulge me as I provide my effusive introduction. In short, Berserk's lore is the most sophisticated synthesis of religious inspiration that I have ever encountered in a work of fiction. It borrows from Norse mythology, Christianity, Judaism, Gnosticism, Hinduism, alchemy, the occult, and of course, a healthy dose of Jungian psychology to go alongside. As I was reading Berserk, I was actively researching the words and concepts that were invoked, and each time I did, I found that it was based on a religious or psychological concept that existed in reality. Everything from the talismans, to the charms, to the symbols on the golems, to the interstice and the astral plane, it is all rooted in real-world mythology, and used appropriately, whereas other forms of fiction might use it because it simply looks cool. With the recent unfortunate passing of Berserk's creator, Kentaro Miura, I wanted to do a video in tribute to his knowledge of these real-world concepts, and how they not only influenced his fiction, but worked in tandem with it. Not only would such a video celebrate Miura's unparalleled knowledge of these concepts, but it would also explain many of the concepts and mysteries that many longtime fans could never wrap their heads around. However, I soon discovered that one video would not suffice. There is just too much to cover. So, I am happy to announce that this video is the first part of a new series of videos where I address every concept and mystery from Berserk. I hope that this new series elucidates why Berserk is arguably the gold standard of world building, at least in regards to the world of manga. Once you understand the underlying concepts that influenced this story, your love and appreciation for Berserk will transform, as Griffith did in The Abyss. That is certainly what happened for me when I understood, and now I hope to pass that gift of understanding onto you. Before I started work on this series, I made a post on my YouTube community channel, announcing that I had finished reading the entirety of the manga. I asked what subjects people wanted me to cover the most. Pretty much every possible subject that you can think of was invoked, but the one that caught my attention the most, as it did when I put out my first Berserk video, was the concept of causality. Like with every other thing that's cool about Berserk, there is the surface explanation that's cool, but then there's a whole bunch of other interrelated stuff going on behind the scenes that evolves the concept from cool to something that will blow your effing mind. I will provide the surface, basic explanation of causality first, and then I will move on to the good stuff. Needless to say, there are spoilers ahead. Causality references the fundamental law of human existence, cause and effect, also known as determinism. Everything that exists in our universe is a product of that which came before. Not only that, we can understand what will happen in the future if we understand the past. In simpler terms, causality is what produces fate. Depending on the biological, cultural, and maybe cosmic conditions of one's birth, it will greatly influence our fate our destiny. In the case of Berserk, Griffith's ultimate fate was the product of causality. He was fated to lead the Band of the Hawk, transform into Femto of the God Hand, and birth Falconia. This is because the conditions of his birth were set up in a way to produce this outcome. If we take the lost chapter of the manga, chapter 83, as canon, these conditions were set up by the idea of evil, also known as God. Now, not everybody in the world of Berserk or our reality is in love with the idea of causality because it might negate the existence of free will. The idea that human beings are in ultimate control of their destinies and are not predetermined to suffer a particular fate. If we don't have free will, it means that some are born to suffer unconscionable tragedies, like the one that the Band of the Hawk suffered during the Eclipse. 
Obviously, it's impossible to say whether free will exists in our reality, but the great thing about fiction is that it allows us to entertain the possibility of free will. Though causality dictates almost everything that transpires in Berserk, I argue that there are instances where free will comes into play. Before I can reference these instances and why they are so thrilling, I will need to make a big, yet important detour. As I pointed out in my first Berserk video, I was asked to cover this manga because it references a lot of concepts by the Swiss psychoanalyst Carl Jung, a man that I've discussed ad nauseum on this channel. In that first video, I referenced two of his major concepts, the collective unconscious and synchronicity. I wanted to elaborate on those two concepts more than I did in the first video, but like I said, I didn't want to speculate only to have my ideas contradicted by future events. I will be expanding upon both these ideas again and how they are brilliantly utilized in Berserk, and I will also relate them back to the concept of free will. There are two sides to the synchronicity theory that I wish to discuss. The first side was referenced in the last video, and the second side will be new. I'll provide a brief refresher on the first side. The first side deals with the union between mind and matter. Jung theorized that there was a material aspect to the products of our mind. To quote him directly, the mind cannot be totally different from matter, for how else could it move matter? And matter cannot be alien to mind, for how else could matter produce mind? Jung believed that we can observe this link between matter and mind in reality through instances of déjà vu. The example I always use to describe this aspect of synchronicity is as follows. Imagine you had a dream about somebody you hadn't seen in 10 years. Then, the next day, you happen to run into that person. That is synchronicity. Jung would argue that these instances are examples of an exterior mind, one that goes beyond ourselves, influencing our reality. Now, in some works of fiction, this inherent link between mind and matter takes on the most fantastical form possible. Some works of fiction, including Berserk, argue that this exterior mind exists. This exterior mind takes on multiple different names, but it almost always operates in the same way. To Jung, this exterior mind is known as the collective unconscious, a concept that the aforementioned idea of evil references in chapter 83. For other spiritual thinkers, this mind is known as the astral plane, a concept that is referenced many times throughout Berserk. Referring to this exterior mind by both names is just one of many examples of Kentaro Miura's sophisticated knowledge of religion and psychology. The collective unconscious slash astral plane is the source of all thought forms. When we have a dream or fantasy, when we imagine a fictional creature or world or something like magic, those things actually exist in the astral plane. In various works of fiction, the concepts and ideas that exist in the astral plane will sometimes bleed into the physical world. In the physical world, those thought forms take on a physical form. For example, in the video game Silent Hill, the products of one's unconscious mind, which is just one part of the collective unconscious, bleed into our reality. We also see this in the video games Alan Wake and Control, where once again, the terms astral plane and collective unconscious are both referenced. Again, same idea, different names. In Berserk, the products of the astral world are always bleeding into the physical world. I'll use this diagram that I found on Reddit to explain how this works. All the mythical creatures that we encounter in the manga once existed in the astral plane, but they bled through the vortex and the interstice into the physical world. The one time we see this happen to an immense degree is when Griffith establishes Falconia. The result of this event was what was called the Great Roar of the Astral World. The byproduct of this roar was Fantasia the overflow of human fantasy into the physical world. Before I move on to the second side of synchronicity, I need to reference the ideal world, the one that influences the astral plane. The best way to understand the ideal world is to view it as the deepest part of the astral plane, which is appropriate because it exists in what is known as the abyss. A good way of understanding the ideal world is as the birthplace of the idea, 
and the astral plane is where the variations of that idea exist. For example, the idea of a demon could be conceived of in the ideal world, and the infinite variations of demons multiply in the astral world. In regards to Berserk, the idea of evil, also known as God, could also be seen as the initial idea, and then there are the variations of God that come after it, like Shiva, the Sea God, or the God Hand. Relating this back to Jungian psychology, these foundational ideas were given a name by Jung. Archetypes. The archetypes are the foundational laws of all existence. They are the exact same things as the ideas in the ideal world. The idea, or archetype, is birthed in the ideal world, and then there are the infinite variations of that idea or archetype that follow after. In respect to the idea of evil, it not only represents the archetype of God, but the archetype of causality, as it says in chapter 83. It dictates the destinies of all human beings through the concept of causality. It cannot be any other way. If the universe were to operate on something other than cause and effect, it would defy the will of God, of the idea of evil. To quote the Skull Knight in chapter 237, it would be akin to someone in a story challenging the one who wrote it. It cannot be done. Keep in mind what I said before about fiction, though. Fiction lets us entertain the possibility of a character going against the authors of its fate. And we see this very thing happen in Berserk. We finally come to the second side of synchronicity. Jung viewed synchronous events, like the old friend example I used, as a causal, that which is not bound by causality. A causal events can also be described as chance. That old friend example does not seem to have a prior cause. Therefore, it is a chance event. An a causal event. Now just like cause and effect was an idea, that became the idea of evil and birthed the causal universe, there necessarily must be the idea of a causality, of chance. Whether or not a causality has been personified is unknown, although I have my suspicions. I will say that the concept is directly referenced by the God Hand. When the Skull Knight saves Guts and Casca from the God Hand in Chapter 88, Ubik of the God Hand declares this event an unpredictable one. Slan, or Slan, retorts by saying that maybe that event was fated to happen, but if it was, it was something even they couldn't predict. Determining whether or not the Skull Knight's appearance was fated necessitates the possibility of a causality. Just like so many minute nuisances that the God Hand would like to get rid of, these nuisances are, nevertheless, necessary aspects of existence. The causal universe requires chance, just like light requires darkness, just like Griffith required guts during the Golden Age arc. This is a direct reference to another spiritual concept that Carl Jung was infatuated with, the necessity of opposites. If the yin does not have its yang, if the light does not have its darkness, there can be no dimension. Even if a causality is an extremely minute possibility, it must exist, so causality can define itself. The same thing goes for free will. Determinism slash causality can only exist as long as the possibility of free will slash chance exists. In respect to Berserk, I think the archetype, the idea of free will, is embodied by the character of Guts. Throughout the manga, he continuously defies expectation. His will is superhuman, impressing gods and humans alike. He struggles against the currents of causality at every turn and succeeds. He is a causality. He is chance. He is the necessary opposite to the causal Griffith, the a-causal thorn in the side of the idea of evil. And no matter how hard the powers that be might try to get rid of him, he will always be there. This is why Guts is my favorite character in the manga. I always viewed the strength of his will to be a powerful tribute to the strength of the human spirit. Even if it's impossible to overcome the currents of causality in our world, there will be those that struggle fortuitously against it. There will be those that try to defy the destiny authored by their ancestral and cultural pasts in order to create an unpredictable future. 
bathed in the infinite light of freedom. But is it worth doing this if it might all be in vain? Well, you just have to ask yourself one question. Do opposites need each other in our reality? Does light need darkness? Does causality need chance? Does determinism need free will? The next time I do a video on Berserk, I will be discussing the franchise's roots in alchemy and the occult. Until that video releases, make sure to hit that like button. That helps me out more than the Skull Knight helped out Guts during the Eclipse. Please hit that subscribe button so you don't miss the release of my next Berserk video, and make sure to leave all your thoughts in the comment section below. Until next time, stay yellow.